We used to meet in the hallway near the principal's office, Frank shuttling off to his fifth period creative writing class and me to my junior journalism students. We'd stop and chat, exchanging tales of woe like two inmates in their prison cafeteria before afternoon kitchen duty. But I'd always linger longer than I would with the other teachers because with Frank, you knew you'd get a fun story, a fresh insight, or a provocative question. Even then, Frank was recognized as a gifted storyteller by his students and colleagues who would listen raptly in the classroom or huddle around him at the bar as he regaled us with his now famous tales of childhood misery. During one of our impromptu chats in the hallway, Frank became animated when I told him I was the child of Holocaust survivors. So, you think you'd ever marry a non-Jew, he asked? Frank told me he was intrigued by the whole question of intermarriage. Two of his brothers, Malachi and Alfie, good old lapsed Irish Catholics, were at one time or another married to Jewish women. It reminds me of what my mother, the late Angela McCourt, once complained about, he said in that endearing brogue of his. There's nothing in this family but Protestants and Jews, Jews and Protestants. God above, every time I cross the floor, I'm tripping over little Protestants and Jews. I strolled onto my classroom, grinning. <laughs> to many of us in 1987, it wasn't a question of if, but when, Frank's talent would reveal itself to the world outside of East 15th Street and First Avenue. But there was one foreshadowing I remember. At a Stuyvesant Awards ceremony, Jerzy Kaczynski, the renowned author of Being There, told Frank that he too would make it as a writer one day. Yeah, but when, said Frank. <laughs> Not many people realize that Frank also had a brief foray as a newspaper columnist at the West Side Spirit newspaper. One night in 1987, he and I were having dinner at his beloved hangout, The Lion's Head, in the village, and he said, you know, Tom, I've always wanted to be a newspaper columnist. Really, Frank, what would you write about? Well, one week I'd go to a pub and review the bartender's ability to mix drinks and make conversation. The next week I'd go to a church or a synagogue and review the preacher or rabbi's sermon. The next week, I go to a school and sit in on a class and write about the school and whether the teacher is really reaching the kids. Pubs, houses of worship, and schools, they're the three most important institutions in society, and nobody covers them. So the next week, Frank began his column called Forays. About a month after he wrote a column about McSorley's in the East Village, he called me from a payphone, breathless. You won't believe what I just saw, Tom. Hanging in a frame above the urinal in the men's room at McSorley's is my column. Do you realize how many people are going to see that? <laughs> I often kidded Frank that until Angela's Ashes was published, that column was probably his best read piece of work. <laughs> I miss those chance meetings in the hallway with Frank between classes or our later get-togethers for coffee at Lenny's on 74th Street in Columbus. We spoke every few months when I could catch him at home between book tours, lectures, writing conferences, interviews, book parties, charity events and other demands on his time. It was a vicarious thrill to see his name pop up everywhere and to see that sometimes in life, talent does win out in the end. I'm a beacon of hope to all geriatrics, Frank once told me. <laughs> Don't give up. You can keep doing it into your 70s, practically your 80s. Listening to him talk about teaching, you realize it was a noble calling. At least in Frank's case, it worked out for the best. Whatever I know about writing, I learned from teaching, he said. They kept asking me questions and provoked me to tell stories, and, and in return, I would provoke them to tell stories. The interaction was very fruitful. I know that the Frank McCord High School that the Chancellor announced earlier is something that would have made Frank very proud. Those of us who have been championing this idea this past year will work hard to make sure that it'll be a school that will live up to his great name, a place where innovative teaching is valued, great writing is taught, and where students will be inspired for many years to come by the story of a penniless immigrant who came to New York from a place called Limerick and went on to live a full and rich life of inspiring teaching and world-class writing and who touched so many people around the world. The Symphony Space has helped with the effort to uh, name the high school for writing and literature for Frank, and we intend to be part of the ongoing connection with that school and helping it 
relate to our literary programs. Now, among our literary programs, the eldest is our annual James Joyce celebration, Bloomsday on Broadway, of which Frank was a part for more than a quarter century. And for that reason, we asked the next pro person in your printed program, the wonderful Fanula Flanagan, to come on her way to Ireland tonight and read a little section from Ulysses, the section in which Stephen Dedalus is told by the schoolmaster that you'll never make it as a school teacher. Um, Fanula called yesterday to say that uh, her filming had uh, been advanced a day. She could not make it, so we called upon another star of the annual Bloomsdays, the wonderful Terry Donnelly, to read a message from Fanula Flanagan and to read that brief section from James Joyce's Ulysses about a young teacher man. Please welcome Terry Donnelly. Yeah. 